Good evening, everybody. It's, evening. it's great to be here. It's great to see all of you. Um, my name is Joe Kahn, and I want to start by thanking Lauren and thanking Creating Citizens and the Commonwealth Club for hosting uh, this event. Um, I'll start by making a, a few comments just about, uh, about the context for this conversation, then introduce our, our uh, panelists and have a bunch of questions for them, and then we'll really look forward to your questions uh, after that. But I will say I've been doing civic stuff for a long time, and most of that time, civics has mostly been ignored. Um, and, and it's, uh, well, I'll give you one, one little factoid about that. So uh, the federal government spends $50 per K-12 student per year on what we call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I won't make you guess, I'll just tell you, the government spends five cents per student per year on civics. So it, it gives you a sense of, of uh, commitment in a certain sense um, that, that has a lot of us concerned. Um, in addition, I think, and I think you know, many of the panelists may speak to this as well, for many of us it isn't just are we doing enough civics, but what are we doing when we say we're doing civics? Are the things we're doing really pre preparing and supporting young people in all the ways we want them to? Because there's certainly, some of you may remember your US government course, or maybe you're in your US government course, and it may not be necessarily everything you need or want in terms of the preparation that you are thinking about. Um, But I did start by saying that, you know, often civics hadn't gotten a lot of attention, and more recently it's been getting a lot more attention. And some of that may be, um, and I think we may talk a bit about this, that young people have been incredibly involved uh, civically and politically in recent years on issues that range from uh, LGBTQ plus rights to racial justice to the environment to uh, gun policy. Um, Voting rates of young people are way up. Um, and both, I think, young people and many of the rest of us are looking for ways to make sure that we're supporting and providing opportunities for agency for young people, because as we know, there's a lot in the world that can be uh, challenging, to say the least. Um, some people are, are, I think, interested in civics, not so much because they're thinking about young people and their needs, but because they're worried about the health of our democracy. So uh, a recent poll by Marist found 83% of both Democrats and Republicans agreed that, uh, that uh, US democracy was in trouble. Um, it's one of the few things Republicans and Democrats agree on. Um, some people, uh, I think, are, uh, are also interested in civics to help us deal with the partisan divides that we're, we're seeing in our society, which are, have grown dramatically over the past few decades, and not just partisanship, but what we call affective partisanship. In other words, people don't just disagree, they dislike one another. They don't trust one another uh, if those people are, are members of the other political party or, or on the other side of a political issue. Um, and as I know, everyone is well aware, those partisan divides and that sense of distrust and sometimes dislike is often leading to a lot of conflict in schools. So part of what is framing, I think the conversation we're going to have tonight is some of what's going on there. I'll share a few quick factoids. factoids. A recent survey found one third of district leaders reported verbal or written threats against educators at their school during the last school year, one third. Uh, relatedly, last year, politics was listed as the single biggest cause of stress in a survey of superintendents. Uh, I think folks are well aware there's been a lot of legislation, uh, in many cases limiting what teachers and educators can do, and there's been a lot of protest and conflict around things educators are doing. So I'll close uh, my opening remarks with, with this. 
uh, survey item, 25% of all teachers said they have refrained from discussing current events because of things leaders at their school or district have said. And even more striking, 65% say they have cut back on their uh, frequency of discussing current and controversial issues because of their own decision they're making to try to avoid some of that conflict. Okay, we could keep talking about depressing facts, <laughs> but uh, we don't just need to know why the situation is challenging, we need to think about what we can do. And for that reason, I am super glad, super glad to have these three folks with me. I, I will start um, with, with uh, Melissa Gowdy Baldwin, who is a teacher and curri curriculum developer who's taught middle school through community college and teacher's college for the past 14 years. She currently teaches high school English, women and gender studies, and AVID in West Sacramento, California, as well as a summer enrichment women and gender studies course for middle grade students at Sacramento State University. That sounds amazing, actually. Didn't know something like that happened. <laughs> Melissa believes history, writing, and critical thinking should be accept accessible to all students, regardless of their background, ability, or experience. She incorporates history into all classes, invites students to challenge and collaborate with each other, and encourages colleagues to bring in creativity for deeper connection and understanding of, of standards. And, and I was very excited to read that Melissa is also an author of dystopian fiction. Her first novel, The Marriage Wars, came out earlier this year. So, welcome. Thank you. Antero Garcia is an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. His research explores the possibilities of speculative imagination and healing in educational research. Prior to completing his PhD, Antero was an English teacher um, at a public uh, high school in South Central Los Angeles. He's authored and edited more than a dozen books about the possibilities of literacy, of play, and of civics in transforming schooling in America. He currently co-edits La Cuenta, an online publication centering the voices and perspectives of individuals labeled undocumented in the US. And his new book, with co-author Nicole Mira is Civics for the World to Come, which was released in July and is available for purchase here tonight. <laughs> Taro will be signing those books after the presentation. Uh, Tesha Sangupta Irving is an associate professor of learning sciences and STEM education at UC Berkeley School of Ed. She also holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. Her, which is, an unusual combination. <laughs> Let's just pause for a minute and appreciate that. Um, I was a fifty dollars per child. You, child. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that was me. The rest of us got a nickel. Right. You know what That's can right. we say? Then I was downgraded to five cents. <laughs> exactly. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Please. <laughs> exactly. Her research concerns the socio-cultural, disciplinary, and political dimensions of children's learning and identity work. Uh, broadly, her work asks deceptively simple, a, a deceptively simple question. What, in addition to mathematics, do children learn when they learn mathematics? Tesha's work with teachers promotes racially, minority, racially minoritized children's fluency in mathematics, while also safeguarding their joy, agency, and collectivity. Through a mix of ethnographic study, teaching experiments, and microanalysis of children's interactions, her research seeks new approaches to teaching and learning that center who racially minoritized youth are and are becoming. So, welcome to the Commonwealth Thank Club. Thank you. And I will start with a broad question. Um, this forum reflects the belief that civics is needed across the curriculum. Um, help us understand this. Uh, what, and I even said in my intro remarks, like remember your government class, so I'm a little off base. What to you is high quality civics education in your discipline? What does it look like and how can it help? Um, Take it away, Melissa. You want me to start? Okay. Well, so 
Um, this semester, I'm currently teaching gender studies. And so when we have this opportunity to talk about civics and bringing in the voices of our students, of our children, it, it comes relatively easy in that course. Um, it is a, it's a history course. Um, it is a course that focuses on social justice and advocacy, you know, grounded in standards, but as well as historical elements. My other classes, so um, when I teach English and then AVID, so I've been teaching English for 14 years, and in that course, it has always been important to me to bring in historical context. Um, I am a historian by nature. I just happened to end up in English because that was who was hiring 14 years <laughs> ago. <laughs> and I also didn't coach, and so I couldn't become a social science teacher. Um, so that was the, yeah, sorry, yeah. I, it was not who I was. Um, so I, I taught English, and it was just every novel that I would bring in, I, it, the historical aspects had to be, it had to be grounded in history. And then from there, nonfiction texts, and, and then really trying to lead my students into seeing the relevance of how could that impact, you know, the city of West Sacramento, how can it impact Sacramento, California, and then even outside of that, you know, um, greater than that as well. And so for me, in, in everything that I do, and, and with the students that I work with, it's always been important that the students learn the standards and those elements that we're trying to teach, but it's so much bigger than that because once they leave the K-12 institution, um, you know, they are participants just like all of us are here tonight. And without the context and being able to collaborate and communicate effectively, you know, they're, they're gonna struggle. And so I feel like I'm called to help with do that on, you know, all the other layers as well that, you know, we are, are charged with as educators. Thank you. Tasha? Um, so I think that's um, right when you look at the history of the discipline itself. Mathematics and science are great resting places for white supremacy. They're great resting places for patriarchy. Um, there is a reason why mathematics is the number one sorter and stratifier of children in our high schools. And it is um, a mistake to think that the evolution of the discipline, which has followed um, the need of the country for global hegemony, right? So whether we're looking to the Truman Report in 47 or the Cold War and Sputnik in 57, both um, great resurgences of STEM education in our schools, or even Obama standing there saying, hey, high school seniors, you are competing with Beijing and Bangalore. We have always tied US global hegemony and economics and military to children studying STEM so that they can make this nation great. Civics, to me, I'm somewhat circumspect, but optimistic, might actually be a way to stop the adults from talking and listen closely to what the children say is the reason they want to study these disciplines. Because when you speak to the children, it is rarely to outcompete, outperform the person sitting next to them. And they themselves feel linked fate they feel a sense of collectivity, a sense of joy and inquiry and problem solving that we as the adults have sort of lost sight of. And so I think civics might be a way to help adults slow down and translate what children have been saying for decades. If we look at the leak factor from the STEM pipeline of gender, of uh, women identified peoples or racially minoritized peoples, they leak because they say STEM education is supposed to serve their community. It's not to be for the corporations and for drone making. They got into it because they thought they could do something for their community, whether they mean literally their neighborhood or whether they mean a kind of fictive kinship with other people who look like them, with the racial histories that they have and the immigration histories they have. And when the cruel optimism they have, because America says study STEM and your life gets good, and then they start studying STEM and life didn't get better, they leak and America judges them for it. I am a failure of the nation state. I'm an electrical engineer and a woman of color who leaked from the pipeline. But I think I'm doing all right. <laughs> and I don't need the paternalistic nation to look at me and say, you are a failure of the nation state because we needed you to make us compete with Beijing and Bangalore. So for me, civics is actually very close to what young people say is the reason they want to do these disciplines. They want to serve themselves and each other to make communities stronger and more enfranchised and a sense of uplift. And so if this is the language that will get adults to hear them, 
I am all for it. Whatever it takes to slow down and listen to them. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And Tara. That's, that's great. We're, we're, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll say a couple of acknowledgments, maybe just to embellish a little bit of what both of you shared. Um, so first of all, as a former English teacher, I should just be very clear that uh, English is the best subject for studying civics. We'll, we'll talk about how all subject areas are important, but I just want to argue that uh, English is the best. Uh, that, that's not necessarily the debate, but I'm going to make it the debate. Uh, and, <laughs> and that's now this new conversation we're going to have. Um, but because I think, Melissa, what you're saying in terms of the ways that literature, the kinds of books, the kinds of storytelling that we can write, that English is a place where imagination should still be fostered in ways that many other places inhibit in our schools every day um, after kids leave elementary school. And so this is the place where regularly we get to see new worlds being written, new worlds being imagined. And that seems like what the possibility of what civics might be. That, that gets to the other point that I want to bring up, and that is that those of us in this room, those of us online, those of us watching this sometime in the future on YouTube, congratulations, you, you found this. Um, <laughs> the, uh, we, we probably do not all share the same definition of what civics means, right? Uh, that was, I think that was, Joe, that was going to be our conversation. It's going to take like an hour for us to just realize the four of us don't share the same definition of civics. Um, but So I will say that for me, when I think about what does civics mean and why is this something that should be happening in classrooms, it's not about uh, partisan fighting, right? And it's not about um, understanding the three branches of government or the, the poor bill in the old cartoon, right? It's about understanding what are the ways where I can participate in the community around me and make a difference in that society, right? That society, as we, as we broaden the scope, might be bound by particular laws and nation states and kind of bigger rules systems. Um, but if we were in maybe the sequel to the marriage wars and there's a big dystopian collapse and we are the only survivors in the world, it's just, it's us in the Commonwealth room here. Congratulations, we made it. Um, barricade the doors from the, the zombies outside. If it's just us, right, where we get to create a new way to be, right, we're no longer bound to these problems of uh, Democrats versus Republicans, right? We are bound to each other, right, and to the relational nature of each other. And to me, that is the possibilities of what happens in classrooms, right? We get to actually look at and understand and, and imagine the affective, the relationships between us, right? That seems like the foundation of what civics looks like. And so when we say that every classroom is a civics classroom, every teacher is a civics teacher, to me, it's about those fundamental relationships that we either choose to teach and engage with, or we offer profound lessons by choosing not to teach them to young people, right? And so I just want to name those as a couple of the spaces that I think about that. Maybe as a, as a, a specific example. Um, so I have uh, four-year-old twin daughters. Uh, they, are, they are monsters. Um, <laughs> unless they see this on YouTube, then they're perfect uh, someday. Um, but, you know, every day they, they are in kindergarten. Or sorry, they're in preschool right now. Uh, I, know, I know this. I know they're in preschool. Uh, and, uh, but they just start, they're in different classrooms right now. And so every morning we have uh, a complex series of negotiations of which child gets dropped off first to which classroom. Who's knocking on that door? right? Uh, and who's going to go in, who's going to hold the lunch bag, right? It is, it is a large choreographed routine that's constantly shifting, uh, and the relationships, the power dynamics between my wife and I and our, and our two kids and, and the two beagles that are also somehow involved with these <laughs> negotiations, right? It's constantly shifting, right? And there is a kind of uh, civic belief that kind of shapes what our community looks like, like our, our small family looks like. Uh, and this, this spins out into their relationships and the ways that they understand each other, the relationships as, as sisters, to the relationships with, with um with their classmates, right? And, and uh, the, the parent who, who bangs our door uh, when, when they get out of their car every morning too, this, this one person. Um, so I just want to name that like, civics doesn't happen just in 12th grade uh, in that government class. Civics happens long before kids ever enter schools, right? And will continue after. And so we should, I just want to differentiate for those of us who are thinking about the difference between politics and civics and community building and that these are different and interrelated uh, pieces of each yeah. other. Well, thank you for, to all yeah. three of you. Let me, let me ask a question then, though, and I think this builds somewhat on what you were raising, Ontario. So there is a lot of pushback yeah. around a lot of these things. And so part of what one has to think about is, I mean, what I heard from all three of you was a sort of transformative, somewhat different, but similar in that each of you were talking about transforming what civics is and can be. Yeah. And I'm curious how you have both experienced, if you have experienced pushback, yeah. and how you respond to that. 
and maybe Melissa, you're you're in the school, so <laughs> so it, you know it's a little different for those of us at the, at the well, not always different. But yeah, sometimes. Well, very well I think right because I work. Um, with children that are under 18. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's this really um, careful and um, deliberate dance and balance that I think that as uh, K-12 educators have to work through and navigate. And especially I will say during COVID and post COVID, you know, there's, there's this societal shift that I continue to talk about in class all the time. It, it's our pause button. And now, okay, what part of living history are we part of? Um, and I tell that to my students constantly. And, you know, with pushback, I think it was a really interesting um, space to be in the homes of families uh, everywhere, right? Like my two children are here, so I, I would be teaching in my she shed, and then I would hear their teachers teaching, and, and then the other teachers teaching, and, and so I could hear what was going on with them. I know that in, for my students that were awake um, <laughs> during my sessions, um, they, you know, I knew there were parents in, in the background. And um, I also know that during this particular time, we had other social shifts happening with BLM as well as LGBTQ rights. And then we had Me Too right before that. So I was teaching English in a very, um, you know, potentially contentious time as well as a very stressful time for everybody. And so you have this very in, in particular time period that's heightened. And then you teach something, for example, like redlining um, that was aligned with, um, you know, I was teaching uh, A Raisin in the Sun. And one of the ways that I had brought it in for my students was talking about redlining and, and disenfranchisement and unfair housing practices. And then how does that look like in West Sacramento? How does that mm -hmm. look like in Sacramento? How does that look like a California and then across the country? Uh, and, you know, that probably would have been okay in the classroom, but because it was, um, you know, in a 50 minute or a 60 minute, I can't even remember what our class periods were back then, um, online in homes without conversation and context for adults that were hearing it popping in and out of the scene, um, it became a moment that was contentious um, and there was resistance to that. And so I've had, I was, I'm grateful for that experience because it's made me more thoughtful in my curriculum. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, we were given an opportunity to, um, at, at our school because of COVID funds and moving forward to expand our curriculum and have it become more inclusive. That has been met with resistance because it is not our stereotypical, you know, literature that we have in our, our courses. Um, and so I think, even within that, sharing conversations with students and saying, okay, well, here's something that's happening. We're shifting. How are you responding? How are your families responding? How can we continue to move forward with this? Should we move forward with it? And really including them in the conversation, I think can provide a lot of power and merit for them as individuals within mm -hmm. their own agency of learning as well, while also acknowledging the resistance that's going to come from it. Sure. You know? Mm -hmm. Did you want to? Are we going to just keep? I don't, I don't know. Do. Sneak trap. <laughs> Please. Uh, I think I think some of the kinds of challenges that we've uh, that we've faced, right? So I will say, when when I was a teacher, I didn't get a lot of parent pushback, and I didn't get a lot of. We were we we're in a very different kind of socio political world than we are today, right? Mm -hmm. um, where was it sixty five percent, Joe, of the, yeah. the teachers who've cut back on mm -hmm. on political talking classrooms, mm -hmm. right? So so thinking of like the statistic, right? I think I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is that statistic, right? That if if classrooms aren't the place where kids can engage and kind of understand the world around them, where else is that going to happen, right? Uh, this is this is probably why some people are calling for an abolishment of uh, schools of education, departments of education. But this is uh, broadly, I think, how we think about how is our democracy made. It's probably made in schools and young people being able to see themselves in the world. Um, and so I, I would say, like, this is a fundamental piece of the kind of. Um, challenge that we're facing is the apathy and fear that teachers are understanding, right? That is succeeding, right? I think this is a kind of political imagination that's happening in this country that we want to suppress and create a fear for teachers to not engage in political conversation in classrooms and are doing a pretty good job at making sure that's happening, right? Based on based on the data that, that you're sharing with us. 
Um, I think the other side of this, the, the biggest challenge is the kind of harm that we've experienced during COVID, uh, during ongoing um, anti-blackness, threats of anti-blackness in this country. Um, the kinds of violence and harm that young people are experiencing are a particular reminder that we, if, if our democracy is not doing well, it's probably because many of us that are a part of this democracy are not doing well, right? Uh, that, that requires deep kinds of harm, that are deep, deep kinds of repair. It requires some healing. Uh, and these are, these are skills, these are kinds of forms of work that teachers are not prepared for, schools have not figured out. Uh, they're not on standardized tests, uh, so we don't particularly care about them. They're, they don't get the five cents or the, or the $50. <laughs> <laughs> right? um, and so recognizing that, right, this is a place where if we want to actually engage in deep, powerful uh, transformations of what civic learning can look like in schools, we need to think about who's a part of this democracy that we're speaking of and how are we addressing the whole needs of everybody who's a part of this before we can actually get towards a more deliberative kind of understanding of, of governance and structures like that. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to agree. I think that... Um so the pushback comes, I think, in STEM education from a couple of different places. So one is um, the fact that in STEM fields, uh, we have evolved in terms of the content standards, the way the public education in STEM works, to completely foreground the discipline itself. So do you know the quadratic equation? Can you do matrices? Do you, and the uh, content, 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 content. And it's driven by content standards and then practice standards that go with it. And practice standards are things like posing, uh, are like asking good questions, making a model, critiquing the reasoning of others. If you look at the eight mathematics practice standards, mathematics happens alone because it's, it's never that you're ever working with anyone until you get to the practice standard that says, critique the reasoning of others. <laughs> That's the only time you do it in math, apparently. Otherwise, you're, it's a completely solo endeavor, right? It's a kind of misrepresentation of the discipline, even as mathematicians do it. If you read the memoirs of mathematicians, they will talk about aesthetics and beauty and instinct and gut. And we don't do that in mathematics classrooms. What we do is we strip it bare to a series of things you have to know and ways you have to do it. And even the ways you have to do it, we do not have a math practice standard that says, pose a problem. It is a completely given world to the kids. Solve what I tell you to solve, as if the adults know everything and you just have to figure out how to recreate what they already know how to do. Why don't we trust young people to pose a problem? Right? And I think it's because we'd lose control as the adults in the room, and mathematics needs control, obedience, and assimilation. So the discipline itself undoes this work by the way it's been created in schools. I don't mean the discipline in the wild and in the world. I mean, the way we've made it this perverted thing of a set of standards in schools that everyone has to master. So in math education, as early as the 2000s, people were doing, I think, what I at least think of as civics work. They didn't call it civics. It was called reading and writing the world. They borrow from education liberation theorist Paulo Freire, and they say, kids should be able to read mathematically and then write the world mathematically. So if you can read quantitatively, you can quantitatively turn those st statistics around that are weaponized against your community, for example, say with stop and frisk or something like that, or redlining, right? If you understand the math, you can turn it back against them. So we've been doing it since the 2000s, and, and quite frankly, with great success, except in insofar as people will say, where's the math? The math isn't rigorous enough. So for as long as we keep foregrounding the content and not giving into the how it moves in the world for the child, we're never really gonna get there. We're always gonna have the pushback, which is related to the accountability system. So teachers are like, you know, I hate in a math class when the kid goes, when am I gonna use this in the world? I said, I love that question. The one I hate is, is this gonna be on the test? Mm. Is it gonna be on the test? I mean, if it's gonna be on the test, they'll, right? So to me, we incentivize young people to turn off their brains and their hearts and learn the mathematics. Mm -hmm. But that's not how mathematics moves in the world and it's not how it's weaponized against them. So for me, the discipline and how it gets cast in schools and gets tied to these high stakes decisions about whether or not you move on to the next grade or you mm -hmm. pass the test, we created that for them. Yeah and we subjugate them to it. And so for me, that's the pushback. We are our problem. Um, and we could just let some of this stuff go and let them be children, mm. right? <laughs> well, and, and that leads to what, and, and maybe I'll mix up the order. I'll go first mm. with you, Tasha, because it builds on, on, the question builds on what, where you just were. 
often, not just in math, but in school, we think about what do teachers do? And if we even when we say civics across the curriculum, well, what do teachers do when they're doing civics across the curriculum? And obviously, or maybe not obviously, we want young people to be the ones doing and yeah. ultimately a great deal of the learning can be learned most powerfully when students are doing. And so I'd be curious as you think about uh, a more ideal world, what have you seen students do? What does it look like? How do we think about this as something that maybe teachers create space for, but what are the ways in which students can really lead us forward? Um, that is a great question. So I think that some of the things that um, come to mind a little bit are, are unfortunately kind of the negative examples, which I'm, maybe I should not be going first. We should start with the more <laughs> aspirational work of my colleagues to we'll the, on a high the note. right. <laughs> What's that? We'll end on a high note. That's right. Okay, you guys will end on a high note. That's good. Um, so um, before I answer the question of what teachers should do and what students should do, I, it's partially also what should teachers need. What do teachers need to know? And mm. most of us coming out of coming, uh, you know, I didn't come in the traditional route. I was an engineer at one point um, before I became an educator. But for most of us, you know, you don't go through STEM fields learning how to do civics, really. Mm. Um, and I've talked to colleagues at, at Stanford who are talking about the undergraduate class as one of the most apolitical undergraduate classes they've ever seen, and they're 60% STEM majors. And they sort of draw, you know, relationships between those two things. So I think, first of all, for a math teacher to understand their work as cultural work is new for some. To understand mathematics as political work is new for some, even though if you look at the writings of Bob Moses, who inspired me to leave engineering in many ways and go, go uh, down the route of education, he tied voting rights, he's an uh, African-American civil rights um, worker in the 60s, jailed and so on. He was part of Freedom Summer. In his book, Radical Equations, every other chapter is about civics, meaning um, voting rights, and then mathematical literacy as a civil right. And he alternates first person stories of his work as a math teacher and then his work in voting. And that's what inspired me to get into the field. But most of us didn't read that text to become math teachers. We were like top of our class, super geeky, fantastic, uh, smart, uh, you know, smart as deemed by schools folks. And so what I encounter from teachers is, uh, I don't know how to do that. Mm. I will do a word problem about your favorite Pop-Tart and have you graph that, but don't ask a political question. That's too political, right? So now if you're gonna ask other kinds of questions like about race or gender or about why it is that in some schools bathrooms are locked and kids can't go, but in other schools are open campus and those children are trusted with their bodies. You can't ask racial and class-based questions about children's experiences because I just wanna ask the Pop-Tarts question because that's already a push for me to expand what math is. And I say this with great grace and humility for the hard work of math teachers. It's hard enough to figure out how to get somebody to understand linear functions. Now I have to do linear functions and also a lesson about race or class or gender or whatever it might be. So I think what teachers need to do is to settle into the possibility that maybe they don't exactly know where the train is going and that that's going to be okay. Mm. If there's in a community that is supportive of them, whether through research or other great, I mean, if Melissa was down the, the classroom way from you, you would work with her to figure out how to do transdisciplinary mathematics work. Not every day all the time, but a couple of projects a year, and those children will feel the sunlight. Mm -hmm. That's what we want. We want every child to feel the sunlight. So if you can incorporate just one project this year, two projects, I think you'll see a kind of loosening up. So it would also mean that kids have to understand that they have a voice in the math mm -hmm. class, which is often not what they're expected to do. Um, so I think uh, in terms of what kids have to do, and I'm gonna leave it to my colleagues to give um, concrete examples of students that they've worked with, but <laughs> I can talk about the teachers that I've worked with who are really, really hesitant because they're like, what happens when I talk about race? Is that kid gonna hate me now? Or is that gonna, kid gonna think I'm ill-equipped? And they're worried about that, and that's okay. Like not even the parents, the kids themselves. So I think we have to trust each other a little bit more in the classroom for this to really take flight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
what do teachers need to do? Uh, I, will, I, I will just say, oh, I'm, already, I'm already deviating from the paper. This is what the notes are for. Um, but I, I had a colleague who was a doctoral student and is now a professor, assistant professor uh, at UT Austin, uh, Emma Gargaretzi, um, who she brought together a handful of uh, math teachers and I brought a handful of English teachers. We basically like, kind of put them in a Zoom room together and say, Let, let's figure out civics together, right? We're, we're the actual most important subjects. Like, let, let's figure out civics together. Um, we created a really useful teaching guide um, for K-12 teachers um, on kind of basic practices of, of how do we think about uh, data and numeracy as it relates to issues of civic engagement. Uh, and uh, I'll figure out a way to, to share that out with you all. Because um, that led to, there's, there's an upcoming conference, I don't know when, but there's a, in planning stages, where the National Councils of Teachers of English and Mathematics are coming together to have a joint conference coming up. Um, and I think there's some, there's some real kinds of growth in the kinds of ways that okay. you're speaking of, mm -hmm. so I'm excited about that. Um, in terms of teachers, though, I want to recognize uh, Maybe I'll keep this in the, in the low point and then I'll end on a high point too. Um, teachers are complicit in the kinds of harm that we're talking about. And so I wanna name some specific ways that I think about this, right? So our teaching profession um, is white and female, right, statistically. Uh, if we look at voting <coughs> patterns, right, we can think of the erosion of this democracy as tied to demographics of teachers. Uh, and if I think particularly about what happens in English classrooms, right, when I was an English teacher, um, we oftentimes, you know, my, one of the fav my favorite units when I was a ninth grade English teacher uh, was the debate uh, unit, right? We, we practice our kind of argue, we, like, uh, like cannons that we're gonna fire at each other. We practice our kinds of points that we're gonna like yell back and forth, not, not ever listen to what the other person says. Like, we know you're going to say this, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this, and I got you, right? Like, we create this kind of, like, cat and mouse game with debate. Um, but it's never about dialogue. It's about debate, right? And the topics that we choose to debate in our classrooms oftentimes are topics that uh, deny or question the humanity of young people from their legal status, their bodily autonomy, uh, the kinds of issues that we're experiencing that, that students feel particular harm about and that teachers are fearful about talking about are topics that we are allowing uh, to center what happens in English classrooms. So I just want to recognize that the profession, again, I think is the most important for civics, is also means that every subject has a complicity within it, right? I think um, Tesh has spoken to some of the STEM challenges in this space too, and I just want to name that every subject has, has a history, has a legacy that, that it's built upon. I think the really powerful part for kids though, on the other side, maybe on like a more uplifting side to all of this, um, is the best way I think young people can understand their role in the, in the world around them is if we elevate community and individual youth expertise, right? Uh, we keep treating kind of following along with the, the um, Paolo Freire work, we keep treating young people as these kinds of empty vessels and we just mm -hmm. fill them up with the knowledge that we adults actually have, right? So you've come into my classroom and let me, let me tell you the stuff you need to know because I'm an expert and I will divin this on to you, um, you poor children, right? It's the kind of model of like how schools are traditionally set up. Um, but the thing that we know is like kid, kids are pretty smart. Community members are uh, elders. Elders and community have tons of value that oftentimes doesn't show up in textbooks as different kinds of histories. Um, and when we elevate that kind of expertise, young people can see themselves as valued, as being able to make contributions and see new kinds of pathways of the formulations they might make with other people around them. I'll give two examples of what this kind of expertise has looked like in some of my recent work. Um, I see one of my um, doctoral students, uh, Jorge Garcia in, in the audience. We're not related though, uh, even <laughs> despite the last name, uh, his loss. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but Jorge worked with, with a couple of my other students uh, to ride a school bus uh, um, uh, I, my, my, uh, my kids were born, and so the, the vision was we we're going to ride a school bus regularly um, from um, a working class area around Stanford um, to a more wealthy district. Uh, and these kids got on this bus every day. Um, but I had kids, so I took paternity leave, and so my, my students rode the bus every day instead. Uh, and so, Jorge, thank you for doing that work um, for the most part. Um, and what this was about was trying to understand what happens on the school bus. We have, we have kindergartners through eighth graders. They get on this bus uh, at 6.30 in the morning every day. They have to wake up at six in the morning to get to school at eight in the morning uh, for school. Sometimes they're late. So they have an hour and a half on the bus. There's no bathroom. You're not allowed to eat on the bus, right? You're a kindergartner with a developing body. Uh, and then in the afternoon, right, you get on the bus at uh, three o'clock and maybe you get home at five o'clock, right? Uh, and you do that every day, right? And these are, this is not a special thing. This is not some like unique, oh, poor me bus. This is what happens across this country every day as a response to Brown versus Board of Education, right? This is the ways we've chosen to desegregate in the school, uh, to desegregate in this country. Um, we, have a, we have a book on this that's free to read online uh, called All Around the Town and it's about the school bus as a form of educational technology. Uh, Jorge wrote one of the chapters of that book. Um, 
I say all this to basically say, uh, the, the lessons that young people learn on the bus every day are profound lessons about the ways this country values their educational opportunity, right? Uh, and the, the work that I think I really appreciated that Jorge uh, and Stephanie and Miroslav did when they rode the bus with young people is just started to ask, they built up those relationships with kids. So after a while, the kids didn't mind that um, this person who's bigger than other students is sitting next to them all the time, right? And then asking them intrusive questions, right? After building up that relationship, we got to actually understand like, what, why are you on this bus? Like, what does it mean to you? What, what do you wish you could be doing instead? If you could read design this bus and you had some affordances, you had, you had $60, right, to redesign the school bus, what would you do differently with it, right? And those are some of the profound insights that we could start thinking about. It's like, what, what, if we gave young people kinds of control over their own basic educational opportunity, what might the world look like that might be different, right? It probably looks similar to the really fancy tech buses that actually float around here, right? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not, you're not allowed on them unless you work on them, so I've never been on one, but I imagine there's a barista, there's probably a masseuse on those buses. There's, there's definitely a bathroom. There's definitely a bathroom. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely a bathroom. <laughs> um, but I, I, just, I can't imagine how good the snacks are on that bus, right? Um, someone, someone in this room probably knows. Um, I'll give one other example and I'll stop, I'll stop rambling. Um, uh, but as Joe mentioned in his introduction, I've been um, for the past year working on uh, an online publication called La Cuenta. Uh, it is written, uh, aside from myself, everybody who contributes to this is someone who's either currently or formerly labeled as undocumented in this country. And the entire purpose, La Cuenta is the, the word for bill in Spanish. It's the, if you go to a restaurant and you ask for La Cuenta, right? This is, I, I want to pay for my bill. And so the idea is for individuals who are labeled as undocumented to name the costs of being, of, of surviving as undocumented in this country, right? What are the costs of healthcare? What are the costs I experience in terms of dating, right? And when do I disclose uh, a status to other people um, or their assumptions about me? And every day, uh, every, so we publish every Thursday, we have a new essay up from someone named Christian Pena. It's a beautiful essay about folks who are left behind when other people um, end up coming across the, the US border. Uh, and every Thursday, we, we publish someone else's perspective, someone else's expertise that oftentimes is talked about, debated about, right? Their humanity is debated in this country every day. And rather than centering that debate, we choose to change that conversation by having other people whose expertise is at the forefront of these conversations be, be a part of that, right? I think there's a ton of educational opportunity when we elevate the conversation and move beyond talking about people to talking and being in conversation with people. Thank you. Yeah, so I, th I think there's a couple things that when both of you were speaking that came to mind is um, the first thing is, is fostering um, a space for our students to have these these conversations in this dialogue that is not um, taking place. Going back to the statistic of the 65% of teachers who are not having that, right? Like, as adults, we need to lean into that discomfort. Like, that is a piece where, yeah, the conversations that happen in my gender studies class, some days I'm like, okay, we can do this. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, I, my, but I am tasked and I am charged with providing and, and fostering a space where students, one, feel comfortable um, sharing their opinions that may not be the same as everybody else in this particular class. Uh, you know, even moving into English, when I go into my English class next term in, in the, the times that I've done it in the past, um, you know, and, and really allowing that um, while they are children, while they are developing, so that when they get to you know our age and we're sitting up here and we're having this conversation and we disagree, we're doing it in a very civil way. Yeah. We're acknowledging your ideas and your beliefs and then acknowledging my ideas and beliefs and still being able to you know go out afterwards and have a cup of coffee or whatever and, and still move forward with how we are going to change our little piece of the world. Um, I don't think that there is a lot of opportunity for that, though, uh, within the teaching profession, uh, because I think we are scared ourselves, you know, and, and with the things that are, uh, you know, tasked on our professional learning and K-12, um, between standard learning, you know, um, MTSS and PBS, all of these things, and, and just reaching our, our students because of social emotional mm -hmm. needs. Um, but... Within that, I still think that there is hope. I'm an optimist. I'm an eternal optimist. It's <laughs> probably why I'm, I'm, you know, surviving and teaching as I am. Um, but I really believe that, you know, if we can give students an opportunity to have those micro moments of, of disagreements on a very small level, that is what's going to change the way that they move forward in life, and that is what's going to allow them to have 
that civil discourse that we are really lacking today, uh, you know, in, in so many different places. And the modeling that they're seeing on TV, you know, among other people just within their community, um, you know, so if we can do that, that could be another, I guess, small form of resistance as well, um, just to help us move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, th let's pause for a moment first and thank our three panelists, and then we're going to jump to more questions. <laughs> But, but I, I really, really want to just appreciate just a whole lot of different and yet overlapping ideas that you've surfaced to help us think about both some of the tensions but also some of the possibilities. Um, and now we got some hard questions. So, and and I, I don't think it's necessary for everybody to respond to each question, but I also think if you've got something you want to say, go for it. Um, we can certainly have more than one or, or three responses is great. So the first one, how can we respond to people who say civics is just critical race theory or some sort of progressive political indoctrination? Because someone's going to say that. So how would you respond? Yes. <laughs> that is us. Um, so I think critical race theory, especially in, you know, the last few years in, in the high school um, has definitely been a hot topic. Um, and that civics, it, you know, I think also in that space of you are bringing your own ideas and, and your own indoctrination. But I think the way that I would respond to that is, um, or that we can respond to it is one way um, is really looking at things through a standards-based lens. So if I'm teaching uh, a, a nonfiction text about something that is happening within society at this given point, and it's grounded in the standards, then, you know, that is, it, it's civics, because it's happening around us. It just may happen to be with, you know, CRT or LGBTQ or a variety of other things um, that are currently happening within the landscape around us. And why wouldn't we want to offer that space for students to have that safe convert or to have that conversation in a safe, controlled space where hopefully the bias is not present, you know, really marking both sides and, 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 developing that dialogue. Um, so that's pretty much how I have tackled it mm -hmm. um, over the last few years um, and really trying to just remove myself as um, the, the I, I guess, I don't want to say the bias side, but really just providing and trying to encourage people to see me as a facilitator of communication mm -hmm. rather than an indoctrinator, I guess, <laughs> if that's even, you know, you could see it that way. Thank so, you. Um, it makes me think of that question. Um, uh, it's a terrible question, so um, don't edit that part out. This is a terrible question. Uh, do you still hit your children? Yes. I object to the premise of indoctrination and CRT being used in this way. You cannot talk about uh, a move toward anti blackness as. Um, you can only see that as racist. You don't get to call anti-racist moves as racist moves. They're just not. I, I object to the premise. So call it what you will. I mean, when we started this 2000, you know, in the 2000s, it was called critical STEM education. The critical of that wasn't about CRT. It was about critical engagement and critical thinking. In fact, the opposite of indoctrination. You want indoctrination? Teach the textbook. Because the textbook says, don't mm -hmm. think kids is Western philosophies. It's Western traditions. It white, it's white ways of knowing and being. Just do it. That's indoctrination. So give me a math textbook, and I'll show you indoctrination. So give me a well-thought civics problem in a math classroom, or a really well-taught math problem that involves critical thinking, and now we're cooking with grease, right? So I refuse to watch DeSantis say, I am the champion of civics education. I will bring it back. Mm -hmm. When he says that, he means something different than Kazir Khan, who pulls out the Constitution and says, Mr. Trump, have you read this? We cannot give in to false equivalence. Those are two very different ways to know this nation, right? And to be a part of this nation. So for me, it's like, it's false at its starting point. So what we do is we engage children critically. I'll even give you an example from a math classroom that's, that doesn't seem like a civics lesson, but on the last day of fractions, a third grade teacher puts up five fifths and four fourths. 
and she asks, equal, greater than, or less than? It's the last day, she figured everybody's gonna get it. African American female child in the front row says, five fifths is greater than four fourths. And you know this teacher's like, oh my God, what is happening? <laughs> But this teacher understands black excellence is axiomatic. And so instead she says, why? And the girl says, because if you slice a pizza into five pieces, everyone in my family eats it, not just four. Mm. What is she thinking about in terms of quantity here? What is she, right, so, so if we open up what it means to even do the disciplines and not give in to the fake language that people want to describe what we're really doing genuinely with young people to, for them to hear their own voices and for their reasoning to take center stage as quantitative reasoning. She is thinking quantitatively, let's be clear. And of course, at some point, she has to know that five-fifths is equal to four-fourths. I'm not debating that. <laughs> but we can't skip over her brilliance in suggesting for a moment that actually if you are food scarce, five-fifths is gonna feel bigger than four-fourths mm -hmm. to your family, right? Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of things I think we can do in the discipline that, that we don't see as civics, but are about my relationship to you, I think is what Antero was saying earlier, Desmond Tutu says it, right? My humanity is bound up in yours because we can only be human together. Those are the lessons I think we wanna see in schools, and so we can't give in to this truly nonsense of trifling people who are gonna misrepresent what it is that we actually know we have always been doing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm a little angry. <laughs> I mean, Which, by the way, I just want to say, fury has to have a place developmentally in our work with young people in civics classrooms. We have to have space for the kid mm -hmm. who wants to flip the table when they realize the way the world is orchestrated against them. They can't stay there, but we have to allow for that moment for them. And I do worry for children mm -hmm. in schools when they have that, given all the corporeal yeah. constraint, particularly of the darker body and the more masculine body in schools. But I do think fury has its place in this world, uh, in this work. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted mm -hmm. to add that when I just said I was angry, I needed to own it. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's what um, uh, CRT scholar Danny Soares and I would call transformational resistance in classrooms, right? That there's a place for, for what that looks like. I, I, I'm thinking about, from an earlier question, Tasha, you're talking about classrooms as a space for obedience and control or control and obedience, right? Um, and I think, I think that's so, Instead, maybe, maybe if you were rejecting the premise, I think I would, I would revert, uh, revert, invert, do subvert in some way, put, <laughs> put, the, put the right prefix on the front of it. Um, yeah, uh, there's, there's some rapper, maybe Lil Uzi Vert, the, the premise, um, and say that traditional civics is indoctrination, and I want to unpack that in a second, and um, pearl clutching, I will say that CRT is being taught in classrooms right now in ways that are really powerful. Um, and so let me, let me talk about that last piece first and say, I think when the attacks against CRT were, were kind of at that, were being particularly heightened a year or so ago, um, I, think, I think progressive scholars did themselves a real disservice by, by kind of taking this, this passive stance and saying, you know, you know, CRT is just this kind of thing that's only done in, in law school and we don't actually do it in schools right now. Um, and we, we seeded the fight. Right. I think I think uh, many uh, educational activists and researchers just chose to kind of not participate in this fight and pretend that CRT isn't a thing that's happening. Um, when, if you look at like the basic premises of CRT, right, recognizing the intersections of race with other forms of marginalization, recognizing the powers of storytelling and counter storytelling, mm -hmm. right, like these are these are the kinds of things you want to be doing in good classrooms, right? You want people to imagine other ways of being, other kinds of ways to remix the possibilities around them, right? That is a traditionally powerful civic act. And for us to claim that CRT is something else and to like mislabel something differently uh, is I think a, prof is a profound loss, I think, for how we're using this label in ways that are particularly pernicious right now. Um, I will say my, my, uh, my friend, my co-author with this, with, within much of this work, Nicole Mira and I, um, we did some work where we basically read through uh, the Common Core State Standards uh, and the NAEP framework to kind of think about how are issues of literacy um, framed from a civic lens, right? What does, what does literacy do? And it does exactly, I think, what Tesha was talking about. It's about control and obedience, right? The ways we prepare young people, first of all, the word civics doesn't show up. Democracy, I think, shows up one time as like a, preparing kids for this great democracy is the kind of like opening 
in language, but democracy never shows up in our standards, right? We pretend like it matters, but it just doesn't show up, right? What actually shows up is we need kids to passively, right, respond to, uh, respond to orders, right? Um, take the taken for granted, understand the basic uses and, and functions of something like three branches of government, or understand the basic ways to, to construct a response to an argument. Um, but we don't want kids to lead. We don't want kids to ask big questions, right? Because there's not enough space within the existing system for young people to agitate and, and disrupt, right? That, that feels particularly inconvenient for a democracy that's uh, particularly out of whack for young people right now. And so what good civics, traditionally, quote unquote, good civics has looked like is about indoctrinating people to be passive and to accept the status quo when the status quo has been harming people for a long time. And so I just want to like revert or invert or whatever revert the, the yeah. premise and kind of recognize that civics historically has been about indoctrination and critical race theory is being taught in schools right now. We just pretend like neither of those are, are the case. I, can I add to that too? Because I want to say um, teaching, and again, and I go back to this post-COVID space where COVID funds allowed us to bring in inclusive texts. Mm -hmm. We teach, they call us enemy. We um, teach, we should all be feminists. We teach Justin Baldoni's man enough. We have this, we have this space where we are having these conversations in a very, um, again, grounded in the standards because in the K-12 institution, that is, that's how you Bread do it. Butter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but we're having these conversations, and I know that we're having them at my school. I'm not sure how it is at other schools. Um, I'm not sure how other schools were afforded, you know, and, and how their funds were allocated within the COVID, the COVID realm. Um, but I think there's a starting place, and things are changing. I will say I've been teaching gender studies for four years. The enrollment has you know, tripled. I had four sections last year. This year I have three sections. Um, and that was because they had to cut a section down so that I would teach English. Because uh, they're like, you need to teach English during CASP testing next term. And I was like, sounds great. Um, <laughs> and so, but when I think about this and how much things have just changed in the last four years, our students are at the forefront of this change. Mm -hmm. And they every day are bringing in things to me that are, they say, oh, I saw this, or I'm, I'm seeing this now in music, or I'm seeing this now in television. Have you heard about what's happening in Florida? Have mm -hmm. you heard about what's happening, mm -hmm. you know, in all these other spaces? And so really kind of just circling back around to focusing on the children. I mean, we are up here, you know, and we have our, our passions and everything, and we're part of facilitating that, that space of knowledge. But the children that are coming up, um, they're at the forefront of this mm -hmm. and they are gonna be who change us. And that's what I continue to tell these students every single day is that you are the ones that are going to be moving us forward. What do you want it to look like? What do you want it to sound like? Um, how's it going to be? And I think that's the, the, the space of civics that we could really maybe um, like encapsulate it and, and ground it in is, is it's them now. Mm -hmm. We just need to be present to help guide them as best as we can within that, you know, in that space. So I yeah, got, what, Joe, what, what, what number question are we on? Well, I gotta say, I got <laughs> a card that right. says last question, last question. Last question right. but I've l been listening to the three of you, so I'm gonna ignore it. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna ask actually two questions and you guys can pick. I like that. So the first yeah. one is, would funding help and how? So <laughs> if I were rich and gave you money, what would you spend it on for this agenda? And the second one is there's a lot of pessimism out there about youth and, and about the future of our democracy. What gives you hope? Do we need to choose? Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna it's going to take some hope for me to be giving you money. But so it, yeah. I think, you know, building off this last piece that Melissa was just saying, I, I, I will say that, um, you know, there is a kind of way in which there's a national disdain for youth on mm -hmm. some level, mm -hmm. whether we're looking at curfew laws or we're trying to constrain what books they can read or trying to increase the voter age. These are all assaults on young people that are happening. And I think the flip of that is look at Standing Rock. Look at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School. Mm -hmm. uh, look at the recent decision in Montana. 
we don't know where we're going, but I think they are onto something. Mm -hmm. So that is the hope, that in those three examples alone, and I could list many, many more, um, young people know something, and maybe it's not that they know something, but that we need to admit we don't know where we're going. Most adults, I'm in my mid or late 40s, I don't know what's 47 count as. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it means that I actually, quite frankly, don't know what even five years from now looks like in this, I, I, are, will the globe have burned? Like, I don't know where we're going. So why am I pretending like I do? So where I get hope from is the possibility that adults will look at the chaos and the humility that comes from that will make them pivot and turn and listen more closely to what it is that young people have their pulse on. Um, but they'll need us. It's intergenerational coalitional work. It has always been intergenerational coalitional work. Antero spoke about it earlier with elders. I'm not saying we are useless, but I'm saying we might not want to be the ones in the front of the bus. Mm -hmm. So that to me is where the hope is, that we as adults can still keep learning and helping guide young people to a place that quite frankly, honestly, none of you know where we're headed. Mm. I know where we're headed. <laughs> it's the barista. Let's mansplain right? the where we're headed. <laughs> uh, actually, I'll just I'll quickly respond to the, the funding question. Uh, would fund? Yes, funding will help. Yeah. Um, but this is where funding won't help. Um, and I'll say this as as we sit in in um, San Francisco, uh, it won't help if you give it to the tech companies, um, which is what which is what we like to do in education. We keep trying to outsource uh, all of our educational quote unquote problems uh, by giving them to generative AI as if that's going to somehow generate something meaningful for kids and democracy. Um, th there is no chat GPT that's going to fix our democracy. There's no system of surveillance that's going to help kids. It's going to actively make it worse. Uh, the ways that we can spend money is to invest in teachers mm -hmm. and to invest in things like oh, yeah, it's a, such a crowd like that. I should, if I ever run for political office, I'll remember. It's just like <laughs> it's a teacher thing. Um, but invest in teachers, invest in local communities, think about mutual aid, right? The people need help right now in like very basic ways, right? We talk about, you know, we, we need to get books to kids. Yes, we need to do that. But also some people can't afford basic forms of healthcare, right? I think there's, there's basic kinds of needs that we need to cover before we ever expect kids to be in our classrooms ready and willing to listen to us. Mm -hmm. So I just want to name like invest in teachers, invest in communities seems like what we should do. It's going to take more than $50 per kid. It's going to take a, a big lift and our country is able to do that if we choose to do that. And that's a, that's a choice that we're making. And I will say yes to funding as well. Like, it's like, oh gosh, yes, I can think of all the things that I would buy with money if somebody gave it to me in my classroom. And it would be books, right? And books where the students that I'm teaching, they see themselves in those books, whether it's race, class, gender, education, ability, um, religion, orientation. Uh, and those, those aspects are, I think, really important. But I think the other thing, like I was alluding to earlier, that there is hope. I see it every single day. I wake up excited to go to work every single day. And I am so grateful to be in this profession that I just stumbled into quite honestly, because I didn't want to work year round. <laughs> and it's like, I tell my students that I'm like, I was in school too long. And then I had a job for a year and I had to work June through August. And I was like, what is this? I am no. So I became a teacher and it was the best decision I have ever made. And I get to um, work with youth every day. I see the things, I see where we're going. They challenge me um, to be better, to be a better mom every day, to be a better friend, a better you know, um, colleague. And I think even within that is that um, they want to do well and they want to see us succeed. Um, they just need help in figuring out what that looks like and how to facilitate that and how to collaborate with someone else when they are struggling. And that's where we, again, come in as hopefully well-rounded, whole, healed um, adults that can help foster that environment for them. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you for, to everyone who's joined us this evening, both in person and online. But special thank you uh, to Melissa and Antero and Tesha 
um, for sharing your thoughts with us tonight. And can I just say, there's one minute left on the little <laughs> clock back there, so we nailed it. All right. Beginning. Thank you, Joe. You <laughs> yeah, did a fantastic you. job as our moderator. Uh, to, <laughs> to, to, Thank you. To, to find out about the Commonwealth Club programs and learn more about Creating Citizens, visit commonwealthclub.org and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. I'm Joe Kahn. This concludes our program, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you.